got it. All right. I'm not sharing my screen yet, though, am I? Hang on. Ooh. That's okay. That's okay. I know. What? Yeah, like this is one of those things where it's like, how does this work now that everyone's watching? Uh, share my screen. <laughs> it's okay. We've all done it. Yeah, I know. Oh, I really want to share my audio, yeah. but I don't yeah. know if that's <laughs> happening. If you hit play, maybe it'll work fine. <clears throat> Pressing play. Can you see a black screen? Yes. 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 Or great that screen. is it. <laughs> I like to throw this in there because it confuses everyone. But the real gag is this when I start. Could you hear that is the question. Oh, oh no. Well, really he couldn't. Oh, I'd have the boom stop. You share your screen? No, no, no. Yeah. So stop sharing your screen. <laughs> Stop sharing screen. Okay, so when you hit the share button, yeah. there's going to be a dialogue in like, let's see what it says. I love this. This it is like says, learning. Share sound and optimize for video clip. And optimize for video clip. The mm. bottom left. Oh my gosh! There you go. Share sound. Yeah. Oh, Try yeah, that. See, thank you. See this is pairing. I love it. Oh no, wait. <laughs> to share your audio, install the Zoom audio device. No, I'm not gonna It'll be that. very quick. It'll be fast. You have to do it though. No, I didn't. I didn't because I had to put my password in then it would be yeah. No. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Just imagine I'll just resume share. Oh, I am sharing my screen. Let me just play right. again. <clears throat> just imagine you heard the Mac startup sound. That's all. Anyway, okay. doesn't matter. This is a friendly gathering, so it's all cool. <laughs> it's not a conference. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm Mel. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. Um, so it's really cool to be in the room in Boulder, uh, which I've never visited, and it's really cool. Um, <clears throat> I'm a member of the Ruby community in Australia. Um, I've also organised a few Ruby comps here, uh, and I've emceed a few as well, which is way less stressful and way more fun than actually being an organiser. So, <laughs> yes, I totally understand the pain. Um, and in this world right now, I can imagine it's even worse because, yes, money is a thing. So I was a software engineer before I was a developer advocate, which I'll get to. I was mostly writing Ruby. Uh, I was introduced to Ruby in 2013 at a Rails Girls event. So, like, that's how I got into Ruby. And as such, Ruby is my first love and my true love. And so I'm very happy to be in the room here. It's really cool to meet you all. Um, yeah, so now I'm a developer advocate at BuildKite. Uh, BuildKite is, I don't know if you know, it's a super flexible, super powerful CI CD platform. It has a hybrid model, which makes it a little bit different to other CI CD. Uh, you run agent, build agents on your own infrastructure in your own environment. Um, and then there's a UI and APIs that we maintain so that you can see all your builds and stuff like that. But enough of that, you can Google BuildKite later. Um, this is a talk uh, about CICD, but through an SRE lens. What I'm going to go cover is run through some of the issues we might face in CICD, and we'll look at some SRE principles that we might apply to chip away at some of those problems. Primarily, we're going to look at what SLOs, SLIs, and error budgets are. Hopefully, they're new to you. Maybe they're not. Uh, and we'll look at how we can use them in a more practical sense as applied to CICD issues, problems. <clears throat> so today's story is going to unfold in three parts. There's a narrative and there's a story arc. It's not a great one, but it is one. So you're in for a ride. Um, let's get into it. Uh, so basically, if we're not if there's no drama, we're really not shipping software. It's part of the package, really. And so let's set the scene. You have a monolithic code base. You have a gargantuan test suite. And you have microservices that stretch for as far as the eye can see, or at least I do. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the software landscape we work in in 2023. There's no denying it's complex um, and it's very difficult to navigate and our teams are getting leaner and leaner, so there's a lot of pressure. Um, I don't know about you, though. I like a challenge uh, and I really am um, guessing you all do because that's why we work in this industry. You love problems. You hate them as much as you love them, but complexity is that thing that we love to untangle. It's a blessing and it's a curse and it's always a challenge worth tackling. So... 
Today I am excited because it's a big day. Um, the epic I've been working on is coming to an end. We're finally shipping a thing that I've been working on for months now with my team. My branch is green. Everything's looking great. Let's go. What are we waiting for? Engage. So it feels really good. My build's kicked off. I have time to sit back and chill for a bit before I pick up my next story. It's great. Mm -hmm. But my build has just failed. I have no idea why, because, you know, everything passed on my branch, but sifting through the test logs, I can see that a test has failed. Naturally, the test has nothing to do with the code that I just changed or shipped. So it's a bit baffling. I'm blocked and I'm going down a rabbit hole again. Now, I don't know how you feel about CICD. I like CICD. Clearly, I work for a company that builds CICD, but I like it more when it doesn't get in my way. And as a software engineer and when I'm shipping my code, I prefer when I don't really notice that CICD exists. Like It's like you stay over there and you do your thing. I'll stay over here and do mine. I'd like to push my changes, know that my code is tested and that it's safe and it's in production within minutes. I don't think it's too much to ask, but sometimes it is. <laughs> and we end up not, <laughs> it's so good, isn't it? it's so relevant. Uh, we end up not trusting our CICD and we end up battling a system and like w adapting and coming up with workarounds to processes that just don't live up to what they're supposed to. Like it says on the label, CICD or continuous integration and continuous deployment is the automation of building and testing code. CICD allows teams to ship code easily and frequently with a high level of trust that end users won't be impacted by bugs. That's what it's supposed to do. It isn't today. It's not easy at all. So at least in BuildKite, I get uh, what is a retry failed step button so I don't have to kick off my entire build again now that it's failed but I'm mashing the button, like retry, retry, retry. I have literally been in this position before. Uh, and the same test keeps failing and failing and failing over and over again. And I don't know what's happening. I only want to get my changes merged. And it turns out it's a flaky test. And it turns out they're a real thing. And I know that because when I Google flaky tests to build this talk, I was like baffled by the amount of memes that were on the internet. So I guess <laughs> what happens when we hit a flaky test, we don't try and fix it or hit retry, we'll go make a meme to express our frustration. Um, so it's good if you Google flaky tests, there are very, very good memes and I could only choose a couple. But um, they happen for a lot of reasons. Um, it's mostly time and time zone related, like everything is. Like I thought I was late to this meeting because like actually I thought it was time zone, but in code, obviously time zones are the old, like, you know, it's always time. It's also test ordering um, and it could also be integration specs, which always kills me when they can't find the element. You know, there's flaky tests and they happen on and off, but hardly any apparent reason at some times. And I remember when I first started as a developer, junior, um, there was this smoke test that literally never passed. Well, it looked like it never passed. And I'm pairing with a senior and I turned to them and I said, why does this test always fail? And he's like, oh, that one. Yeah, that one hardly ever passes. And I was like, why do we run it still? I was like, is this because I'm junior and I don't know why we would still run it? Or am I missing something here? The reality is from that moment on, I would constantly be asking every time I saw red in my tests or my um, CI, I'd be like, is this a real failure? Is it a flaky test? Surely it's a flaky test. It's always a flaky test, even though it probably could have been my code or probably was my code. My first instinct was to think that it was not true. And I think then you end up in the position where you no longer fully trust what's happening in CICD. And I think as I said, the goal of CICD is to um, provide us with fast, reliable feedback, right? And when it doesn't, we have problems. And ultimately, if you don't trust it fully, so are the end users of our services and systems. As developers, we need to trust on the tools and the systems that we use to get our job done, ultimately. 
Um, because I like rabbit holes so much, um, I ended up going down this like rabbit hole of trying to find out what the impact of uh flaky tests was on build cart users. And I ran some queries and I was staggered to see these numbers. They're really, really big, very real monetary cost associated with retrying failed steps. So over a one month period, build cart users alone spent 9,413 days hitting that retry step relating to flaky tests. So it's a huge number. Uh, to use the Martian for scale, you can get to Mars and back 17 times in 9,413 days. So that's really, really big costs and big impact to our teams if we're waiting and waiting and waiting. And besides the time I've spent hitting retry, to see if the test fails or passes again. I've lost my flow, you know, I'm like in Slack, getting rid of all the white dots. I mean, whatever social media happens to be popular at the time, looking, looking, scrim scrolling. But it takes time to get back into the zone. And it's also really disheartening when you have to go into Slack or wherever you chat and going, pasting in the file name. Does anyone know if this is a flaky? Has anyone else seen issues with this test before? Um, it's just, if I'm also battling mega slow builds, I just want to ship my changes. I just want to get my changes out. So I don't need to go on. You get the picture. Um, I'm sure some of you have been in this position before. It's a bad place to be. I don't like it. That let's look at how to get out of the funk. So how can we minimize the impact of situations like this one? It turns out SREs know a thing or two about ensuring systems are reliable. The clues in the name there. Um, a bit of a history lesson. The first SRE team was formed in Google uh, in 2003. They wrote a book called Site Reliability Engineering and How Google Runs Production Systems. It's a really, really good book. Uh, very easy to read. Lays out some of the principles and practices of SRE and the benefits of this approach to maintaining services and infrastructure. Side note, you would think this would be a monitor on the cover. It turns out it's a lizard. Um, I'm not sure where they missed that opportunity <laughs> to have a monitor there. Maybe it's on another O'Reilly book, but whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah. We can't talk about SRE though without talking about DevOps because they're semi-related and obviously DevOps was out was around probably first, but in Google's book, DevOps is defined as a loose set of practices, guidelines, and culture designed to break down silos in software engineering, operations, networking, and security. And that's really it in a nutshell. It encourages us to remove any silos or barriers that exist either organizational or between the different disciplines in our teams, encourages us to accept that accidents are a normal part of building and maintaining software. Uh, and it encourages us to embrace gradual change and naturally CICD uh, plays a big part in that. And whilst um, tooling and automation is super important in DevOps, DevOps uh, thinking understands that it's really the culture and the human systems and processes that are the key to uh, making and ad adopting change uh, and our ways of working and the health of these things are far more critical to success than tooling or automation could ever be, which I love. Uh, and finally, they say that um, measurement is crucial for success, and it's crucial to the success of all of the things, um, breaking down silos, managing incidents, and it's essential also to be able to clearly and objectively measure and verify reality. So DevOps is a philosophy. Uh, it's a way of thinking about our work and about our organizations as an ecosystem and it needs love and nurturing and care to keep it working and keeping it healthy. Whereas SRE, on the other hand, is far more practical. It's about improving operational practices, efficiency, and the name suggests that the reliability of core systems, which sounds good because I want the system I'm talking about today, CICD, to be very reliable because it kills me when it's not. Um, now, there's many examples of SRE principles out there. There's no catch-all definitive list, but there are some common characteristics included in any definition, uh, and that's the automation or elimination of anything repetitive. 
especially when it's going to reduce costs. And I think we can all appreciate that one. That's what we strive to do. Uh, system design with a bias uh, towards reduction of risks to availability, latency and efficiency, which again makes sense to us. And I think um, that we should have the ability to ask questions about our systems and our system health without needing to know ahead of time what we might want to ask. So we need observability into the state of the system. And my favourite one of all uh, is that we should avoid more reliability than what is strictly necessary. And um, I love this is an SRE principle because I used to think it was because I was lazy, but as engineers, we are all um, pretty much across this particular point. And that's like, goes with over-engineering, right? It's like, don't do the work you need to do, um, or just do the work you need to do to get the thing to a point where it's acceptable and don't over-engineer, that comes later. So I like that one, that's my favorite one. So SRE uh, focuses on reliable services, but 100% reliability is never the goal because it's unattainable because we accept that mistakes are a part of software as well. Um, and if you're not making mistakes, I'll go out on a limb to say you're either lying and covering them up really well, or you're sending your company broke by ensuring everything is absolutely perfect. And as we know, perfection is unattainable in software because the lines are always shifting or the goals are always shifting. So um, SRE seeks to ensure that systems are only as reliable as strictly necessary and defining what's necessary is the fun collaborative part and really a practice unto itself. So thanks for being in this little SRE shaped rabbit hole. Uh, it's been nice, but I still have that feature to get out and people want to know when that's happening. So um, turns out Mercury is in retrograde at the moment, uh, so I could be bummed out because of that, but if I'm honest and really, like, we've got problems with our systems, uh, with our CICD. We've had them for a while. They keep cropping up when we least want them to, like today. But how do we begin to address the problems? Well, we've just heard about SRE and some of their principles, so let's look at putting them into practice. So... Things are bad, at least they feel really bad. Uh, we know we have a problem with flaky tests. We're pretty slow about how slow our builds are, sad about how slow our builds are, and, we, um, and how long we need to wait for a build to kick off. We know it feels bad, right? But how do, how, what do we actually know? So remember DevOps thinking and SRE principles say that we need measurement which is crucial for success and that we also need observability and ready access to data and information about our systems. We need to measure the health of our systems. We need solid metrics as that objective foundation so that we can have conversations with our teammates and our leaders, people who prioritize our work. Uh, and we need to be able to all agree that it represents an accurate picture of reality. Um, and if we rely on this to illustrate what the monetary cost of this actual pain is, the pain that we feel, um, it's no longer about feels, it's about data. And that can drive the maintenance of key systems, which if you're responsible for delivering features, um, maintenance and upkeep is like the hardest thing in the world to pr prioritize and justify. <laughs> it's like you finished the thing, you're on to the next thing. You don't have time. So this, this um, way of working is actually a way to get everyone in the room together to agree on a thing and to measure it and then prioritize work. So it sounds good. How does it work in practice? Let's take a look. Um, I love this quote. Um, and similar to being impossible to do your job well without clearly defining what well is, um, how do you improve things if you don't actually know how bad things are to begin with, right? So site reliability engineering uses SLOs, SLIs, and error budgets to do this and do explicitly document expectations around what well actually is. So they use them to define uh, what's important and how, how reliable things should be. And they use them to measure how performance is tracking against them or how well things are going. So an SLI is a key metric that's used to indicate whether and measure whether an SLO is being met. Uh, these are the metrics that you'll use to actually keep track of how well the system is doing. 
And an SLO is literally a promise or a commitment that's made in relation to something that matters to the users or maintainers of the system. It's like, I hereby commit to keeping you happy, but only this level of happy and no more. So, hmm. yeah. And where an SLO defines what exactly um, the users of a system or maintainers of a service can expect, the error budget defines how much or for how long the service can fail to meet that SLO without consequence. So the big question is, how do we get everyone to agree on what uh, things to set? So I'm going to guess that if you're feeling the pain and if you're sitting there thinking, this sounds like a reasonable thing that we could probably try, then others around you are probably feeling that same pain too. Um, and enough's going down in our teams and our companies at the moment. We need some bonding time together. And the perfect thing to bond over is how to improve things together. So we'll go from like no more gut feels and no more feeling pain, no more being reactive and shifting focus when things are blocking us. Um, <clears throat> we'll use a framework for that. We're going to have, we're going to assign metrics. We're going to strive to uphold them. And only when we need to, we will do work to fix things. So now is the time to ask some questions about your system. In my case, that's CICD. So you get everyone in the room together with a whiteboard and start building a shared understanding. And you'll start asking all of the questions relating to the thing that you're talking about. You will define the scope of the system that you're talking about. Is it CICD? Are you going to limit the scope to your application's test suite? Is it its speed? Is it its reliability? And who are the system stakeholders? They should all be in the room with you right now when you're doing this work. Who relies on the system? Who uses it? Who maintains it? <clears throat> what is important to everybody? Uh, what is working? What isn't working? What needs to be better? The quest of the exercise is to understand what everyone, all of the different people expect and to build that shared sort of understanding of we expect this. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need a coffee. Oh, I'm just going to have a sip. Uh, once you have the shared understanding, though, it's time to agree on some SLOs, some SLIs, and some reasonable error budgets. I'd recommend if you're starting out with starting with one is fine, right? To try the method of working, you can, but I wouldn't start with any more than three. Three is too many, probably, to start with. But let's look at a few examples of what they could be for these types of things. So you might want to um, stop developers waiting around for builds to kick off. A reasonable SLO for that could be that builds should start running within 30 seconds. Your SLI could be the time spent waiting for a build. Uh, and your error budget might have 33 builds that take more than 30 seconds to start running in a three-week, a four-week period. Um, just as a side note, Google's SRE book suggests that the method to calculate an error budget is one minus your SLO percentage. Again, it's it's quite a complex thing and it depends what your SLO is, but if you Google that, like how to set an error budget, um, there's a ton of blog posts out there about that, but this is a good rule of thumb. Uh, you might commit to developers having commits tested and notified of success or failure in five minutes. Your SLI would be total build time and your error budget would again have a number of builds that would finish in more than a whatever your number is in a four-week period. When it comes to my problem today, a great SLO would be that my test suite should have a reliability of greater than 87%. SLI would be test suite reliability score. Error budget might be, you know, 77 test runs with a reliability score of under 87%. And once there's been more than 77 test runs under 87% reliability, that budget is then gone and it's spent. How do you get all the metrics? Good question. Uh, glad I asked. Um, when it comes to monitoring production systems, obviously Datadog and Honeycomb are the big players. Um, Honeycomb even have a product for specifically managing SLOs along with their observability tooling. They're a one-stop shop. Uh, but there's many other services that will allow you to configure custom metrics. And um, <clears throat> for a total wait time SLI, uh, BuildCart has a tool for collecting agent metrics from AWS, uh, CloudWatch, all the places. 
and also have open telemetry instrumentation built in so you can send traces to um, tools with an open tell collector like Datadog, Splunk, Lightstep. But if you don't use BuildKite, fine. Um, your CI CD, like I'm assuming, will have these metrics available as well. Uh, Datadog has a CI visibility product as well. So you could use that. Um, and you can instrument build and pipeline tracing with Honeycomb. Uh, once you have this SLO being monitored via the SLI, you can start tuning build agent capacity as the need arises. You want developers to have speedy feedback loops. This SLI, as I said, would be total build time. Uh, we have a REST and GraphQL API endpoints to get this data. Uh, in our UI, you can see there's a um, monthly average build time for each pipeline. And again, your CI CD will likely have this data available as well. So once the important thing is once you're measuring this build runtime metric or once you're watching it, you can start tuning your CI infrastructure and pipelines as you need to, but only once you've spent the error budget. So let's imagine you've had more than 33 builds that take longer than five minutes. Uh, let's get the times down. Like I said earlier, BuildKite's hosted on your own infrastructure. You can leverage the same cloud-hosted auto-scaling compute capabilities as you would, and pipeline steps can be optimized to run across as many agents as you need to speed up your builds. I just really wanted to use that cat, um, Speedy Kitty, but um, <laughs> this is what... <laughs> It's so cute. Um, this is what uh, test splitting looks like in our UI, but... Um, yeah, BuildCut has a bunch of tools to want to auto scale within, you know, a few clicks. But if you you only need to do this work again if you've defined this as something that's important to your team and you've exceeded your error budget because your SLO is no longer being met. Uh, so speeding up builds isn't just about optimizing your build agents or scaling your infrastructure. It's also important to consider the speed and performance of your tests which is something that we are all um, close to, I guess, as software engineers. So uh, at, we have a test analytics tool that you can use to track down your slowest tests in a list and identify some really quick speed gains for builds. Um, as a side note, you don't need to use BuildKite to use test analytics and you can use it for free. So it's worth thinking about even just to um, integrate and look at get a baseline of what your test's uh, health is looking like. Uh, even if you don't use BuildKite and you don't want to pay for it, uh, you can use it with GitHub Actions, Jenkins, Circle CI, And there's also a bunch of test collectors for a whole host of different test frameworks, including Jest. But obviously there's mini tests at RSpec because we are a Ruby shop and we built it first for those things. But it's basically just including um, the BuildKite test collector in your gem file and few other little steps, but you can then go to the UI and see all of these things like your least reliable tests, your slowest tests, very good insights. Um, in this example here, you can see uh, the resulting graph uh, that the, the pattern that happens by optimizing a single test. So I picked a test out of the slowest test list. Uh, the test formally took 35 seconds and now runs in under three seconds which was just done by swapping out a capybara matcher. And like, it's pretty epic when you think about it that I managed to trim 32 seconds. Yes, I did my maths correct. Uh, 32 seconds from um, a single test. So if you imagine that like done across an entire test suite, like there's some pretty big speed gains to be won. But really it's a game. Once you've defined what's important and once you you understand what users of a system or you expect from a system um, and you get the access to the metrics that you need, that's when you can invest in getting some of those winning feelings. So there are many numerous ways to build, bring build times down. Um, you can look at auto scaling, running tests in parallel. You can also build dynamic pipelines, which is something BuildKite allows you to do which is to generate your pipelines at runtime using code rather than in a static config file. Um, you can limit the amount of work that you're doing in the builds based on whatever logic that is. Um, there's a Ruby gem called BuildKite Builder uh, that is um, a pipeline builder that's written in Ruby 
Uh, it allows you to build your pipeline and with a Ruby DSL for dynamically generating pipeline steps. You can do things like only running certain specs based on what code has changed, skipping RuboCop if like no Ruby code was added or changed, heaps more things built by Gus, built at Gusto, and you can find that one on GitHub. But you can see there's a stack of efficiency gains to be won once you've decided you need to optimize things because you've set that SLO and because you're measuring its performance. So this again is the problem that blocked me today, which was test related. The SLI is test reliability score. So again, with um, test analytics, you can get that test reliability score and you can see it's looking pretty low, 77%. I said it should be higher than 87%. So it looks like I'd have work to do before too long because I said I'd have a certain number of test suite runs under that percentage again. I can ignore it until I need to look at it, which is when that error budget is spent. So we also released a flaky test tracker, which is now in public beta. This is a list of 100% uh, definitively flaky tests. So this is a pretty cool tool. Um, but if you don't want to use test analytics or build card, that's totally fine. There are a ton of other open source tools that do similar things. Um, like it does sort of a thing, if there are a problem, think about prioritizing, fixing them using the frameworks of the SLI and the SLOs. So great to have insights and data, but again, if you don't prioritize the work, there's no point in having these insights. It's like any tool or automation, it's only good as good as the human systems and the processes around it. So once you have visibility, once you have these insights, you have the data to have the conversations to make decisions and prioritize the work. So it's both horrifying and amazing that we have ready access to the metrics we need. It's horrifying because we now know the reality of how bad things are and it's no longer about feels. It's also amazing because we're now in that position to have the conversations uh, to really improve things. It turns out that the test that failed earlier was a flaky, I guess it's no surprise. But now that I know it's a flaky, I can quarantine that test and I can move on and get my feature out. So that's very good news. But getting to prioritize these work, this work and using these insights, like that is the hard part. And like I said, that's where error budgets come in. They are a gift to focus. We basically spend the error budget. We can spend it, spend it. When anything crops up, we can ignore it. We, while we're in budget, it doesn't, you know, we don't have to drop out anything and go down that rabbit hole to fix a thing. Um, if it's unrelated to the work we're currently doing, we ignore it, we resume work, no more rabbit holes. They basically exist so we can maintain momentum and focus on the work that we are already doing. But it's once the error budget's gone, that's when you will have need to have brokered an agreement on what happens. And it's usually time to stop what you're doing, down feature development and roll up your sleeves and do maintenance of the system to get the SLIs back to meeting your SLO. I think this is a safe space so we can be real together, but the concept of downing of downing tools and stopping feature development, um, it can be a huge point of contention in teams, um, especially with product managers or the pressure from above. It's probably the hardest thing of all when you're trying to implement this way of working. I've seen it happen, you know, where there's the, uh, no, we really need to work on this thing, but it's like, but... You've already had the conversation in that room to, do, to all agree on what matters and what people expect from the system. So the conversations are at least easy to have and you have the metrics to back them up. So um, it's important to remember that SLOs, SLIs and error budgets, they're a journey. Uh, they may be dragons, um, but they can be iterated upon, like change is okay, we accept change, we like change, and none of these things are written on stone tablets, right? You can change them. Um, but I think starting out small is like the best way to start. I've often been asked, like, how can we start? And a good way to work is setting an SLO that um, promises to sit where you're currently at, right? Once you get access to those metrics, if you set the SLO to, you know, this is our current performance, at least you know that you're not dropping below that, 
right? You're just promising to keep things where they are so that if they get worse, then you have to do something. So that's a nice small way to start working. But there's massive gains to be won. Just by asking some questions, setting some goals and upholding some work towards them. Uh, I'll leave you with this really amazing example from one of our customers who started tracking total job minutes. Uh, they managed to save 1.8 hours of job minutes per engineer, which doesn't sound huge. Um, but with 2,600 engineers, that equates to 10 years per month saving in job minutes, which is a pretty, pretty big, amazing number, uh, which, you know, there's no one in the business or higher up that's going to disagree that that's impactful work, but you need the numbers to back it up, right? It's like, yeah, we're doing a good job, but what job are we doing? We just did this job. We just did save 10 years per month in job minutes, which no one can deny is winning really so just imagine the new world you'll iteratively manage the ever-growing complexity of your systems you'll be able to prioritize maintenance and upkeep you'll be happier have focused developers with clearer goals and tracking you'll save time and money uh, and more importantly you'll restore trust in whatever the system you decide to prioritize the work in You'll restore trust in CICD, ship less bugs, and protect your customer experience. I'll leave you with this charity majors quote that is all, like naturally spicy and completely on point. Uh, SLOs are a powerful weapon to wield against micromanagers, meddlers, and feature-hungry PMs. They are an API for your engineering team. Uh, and that is all. Thank you so much. I hope you've got some new ideas. Um, that's me on the internet. Uh, I would love to like meet you all and hang out or at least stay in touch somehow because you know I'm not going to get to Boulder anytime soon. But all right, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Thank you. I can stop sharing. Are there any questions? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can answer them, but I can try. No, I'm, I'm, I have questions. Like, I want to know, because I never get to ask questions, because it's usually at a conference. But, like, does anyone work in this way? Like, do you use SLIs and SLOs for other things? Yes. <gasps> I should work with this. Yeah, I'm not surprised. How do you use them in relation to what? Um, let's see. So the infrastructure team that runs like our SaaS product has a collection of kind of like the door metrics that they use. Um, uh, we watch like we watch bug counts. So we, we that's a that's a pretty big one. Also, like how fast do we like deal with bugs? And a lot of it's like uh, accepting like how fast do bugs get routed to the teams because we have what nine teams that are part of from cloud so like bug routing is a thing and how fast do teams pick it up and like investigate bugs and resolve them or either say they'll be fixed or they won't fix you know like basically kind of response times on bugs so there's like two examples we also have okrs that we use for like product specific type stuff which isn't really slos but it's kind of related mm. Yeah, that's cool because that can be used to like speed up like in, in relation to the bug thing. It's like that could just be to optimize the communication channels between how bug gets filed and like how it gets distributed to a team, right? Not even just like, like from yeah. an engineering perspective, once it's on my to-do list or on my card wall, when do I, how long does it take me to fix it? It's less about that, more about optimizing the breaking down the silos. Pod. Right. And also the, the classic challenge is that many engineering teams are going to want to prioritize shipping features, but they'll they have to balance that with other things they have to do, uh, mm -hmm. like maintenance or you know, investing in their tooling or whatever. And so, you know, EMs have to, because they're tracked on these things, that that's they're their eyes on how will they balance stuff. So if they ignore bugs, 
and then that kind of it becomes obvious. Yeah, that's yeah something I like that. Because we find that like feature teams are really good at prioritizing feature work, right? And like PMs are really loud, product non-technical people are really loud in the room. And unless you have something like an SLO, yeah, you don't have a fighting chance at actually getting like other types of work done. Yeah. yeah. We don't, we don't do work unless it's tracked against an SLO at this point, basically, because it's just not even worth, because the way, it's kind of like a, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around, does it make a sound? Right. Our joke is like, if it has an S, if, it, if you don't have an SLO, how can you prove that you made something better? Yeah. And that goes for like basically yeah, almost that. anything that work at this point. Yeah. Aside from like the worker hours, is there any financial like, Costs associated with how many times you have to run your test suite over because I mean there's the infrastructure cost, um, obviously, like which has an environmental cost, which has everything cost. Not that the not that the company necessarily cares about that, but I mean infrastructure is cheap, I guess, really, if you're using AWS or something. But no, I mean the monetary cost is really the the loss of trust, which can't be quantified in terms of money, but like there's that vibe, right? The pain, that has a cost. But I think the waiting, I mean, even if you're just retrying a step, but in other CIC, you might be retrying a whole build. Um, that's a number that's spent waiting. Well, you waiting. I mean, it's like as much as we like to run builds and not watch them, I don't know. I'm watching it. I wanted it to run and I want to see it go green. So it's just time spent not, you're not deep working while you're waiting for that to happen, right? When you're getting back into deep work. Yeah. yeah and you can't, you can't switch gears into the next thing because it's not out yet. It's like you're waiting or if it, it fails on a flaky test then, I mean, I see the frustration on teams when too many flaky tests and they're like, uh, it can be, you know, I'll see where like a day will be really sort of tanked for a team because they're fighting that all day. Yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I've been there. You yeah. Have, you have the test reliability score. To, what is the the 10? Is it the Joel test from Joel on software? Mm -hmm. For the 10, how do you score on the 10 things? Yeah. What's the SLO for like a test reliability that you could like put on an interview question? Yeah. Mm. Is what you talked about, like the coil of flaky tests. I've seen it kill teams too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like, and then sometimes those are just really hard to chase down. Yeah. And they'll just like spin their wheels on it. We have a we have a yeah. tool that, that it, uh, once your test falls below a certain reliability rate, it automatically opens a PR that removes the test. Huh. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, because it's no longer a useful test. If you right, yeah, signal. yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. What's the tool? Is it an internal tool that you built? Yeah, it's internal. Oh, damn. It's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good solution though. I mean, that's what this kind of thing does. It's like, if the reliability is really that bad, you would just remove it. Cause like, it's no longer doing what it's said on the box truck. Right. right. Hmm. Cool. I guess I'm curious from others in the room that don't work at a larger corporation, what this looks like for you all. Yeah, usually for, I mean, for us, it's just like, at some point, like we know, like like we have to address this. But, yeah. Um, but I mean, the thing that comes to mind is like we had kind of just built up this. Uh, it's like two year period where we weren't keeping up to date on versions of everything, mm -hmm. and then like we hired a new guy. You might even know him, Jim Gay. He knows you. Yeah, Jim. And Jim just got to work at like right. bumping everything. And now it seems like we've halved how long our CI takes to run and most of our flaky tests are gone. There you go. So, yeah. No, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of pain. Oh, yeah. Sure. But yeah, about three months and yep. big improvement. Nice. I was always the person on the team that liked doing the upgrades. <laughs> 
But yeah, you you need that one person that really likes doing that work. Otherwise, it never gets done on a small team. <laughs> if you have enough juniors or young, know, they don't even know that it's okay to go start doing that. But when you hire someone who kind of is expected, they just start doing it. You're like, oh, that's all I had to do was just <laughs> right upgrade conservative and then go. <laughs> All right, any other questions, thoughts, comments? I'm the Rocky Mountain. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, I would love to. <laughs> I think, um, is it Jeff Casimir? Is that his name from? Um, yeah, yeah, from Turing. From, yeah. from Turing, yeah. Once upon a time, like I think it was 2016, he spoke at a RubyConf in Australia. And he's yeah. like, come to Rocky Mountain Ruby. And he's like, you can sleep on my couch. And it's like, how do I swing this? <laughs> I'm sure we can find you a Once couch. I'm sure, I'm sure yeah. a couch can be found, that's for sure. <laughs> Actually, we oh, did that. That's so good. I think we did that early on. Rocky Mountain yeah. Ruby had like, you know, let, let us know if you have a couch available or someone. Oh, yeah, I'd be grim slept on my couch. Right? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So good, so good. Uh, in the old world, I would have been able to just somehow justify that, but like we're like no spending. Yeah, <laughs> like true. every other company. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the world has changed. <laughs> I like this hybrid thing though. I've never actually done it. Well, I've never actually done it where it works. Like I've spoken remotely conferences but it's usually submitting a like pre-recorded version and okay. this is really well done people <laughs> i think like i actually feel in the room it's really good nice yeah yeah well we I'm really appreciate you connecting with us and come you know waking up well i guess it's not that early for you no it's like lunchtime here it's like fine lunchtime. That's it's just right. <laughs> that it's tomorrow it's tomorrow it's thursday right. and thursday is thursday. good you should join me one day soon <laughs> we will eventually <laughs> <laughs> all right cool all right well thank you mel thank you yeah i'm happy to come back sometime maybe i'll just come yeah. as a remote attendee for sure, for sure. Cool. I might sign up for the. Is it on meetup.com or how it do you? Is. It is on meetup, yeah. Maybe I'll just join the group and just you come. Totally. On. Yeah. yeah it's a, you, um, new information is always there, so you can just dial it. There. Nice. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Melbourne is beautiful, Bye, everyone. by the oh. way. So. Uh, Melbourne I'll, is pretty good. I, I I've been I went to a, a business conference there a few years ago and just had a great time. You know that took a tour on that coast road or wherever it is, you know? Oh yeah, Great Ocean Road. Great Ocean Road, yeah, yeah. So I just thought it- Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I like mountains and skiing, so I should really come to- You should. Yeah. Probably yeah. should have this. <laughs> yeah, totally. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. See ya. Bye.